Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Elliot Ruga. I'm the Policy and Communications Director at the New Jersey Highlands Coalition. Thank you for joining us for tonight's discussion on Grown in New Jersey, uh, Sustainable Food Systems in the Garden State. Agriculture is a very important activity in the Highlands region, and it is supported by the Highlands Act. And agriculture, as we know it, has been broadened, broadened by new initiatives both here and such places that, such as Newark with, its, with Newark's 35,000 acre forests in the highlands and its five water supply reservoirs. Newark has an invested interest in highlands water quality. We have a great lineup of presenters tonight, but first I'd like to uh, present our sponsors of tonight's program who will say a few words to us a bit about their organizations. Here first is Eric, Derby from the Food Shed Alliance. Eric? Hi, everybody. I'm Eric Derby with the Food Shed Alliance. And the Food Shed Alliance is a 10-year-old nonprofit. We work at the intersection of food, farming, and the environment, um, getting food to people in need, uh, making sure that we pay attention to our local food systems. Uh, the Food Shed Alliance uh, started a program that I manage called Sustainable Agriculture Enterprise. Uh, sustainable Agriculture Enterprise started about two years ago, and we we now have seven new farmers, organic farmers, on preserve farmland in Sussex and Warren counties. Um, the program uh, was designed to be a land access program for farmers uh, that allows them to apply for an organic lease, uh, a 10-year lease that gives them the ability to grow uh, sustainably um, for our community. Um, and it's, it's just a great program that has now has 10, uh, uh, seven new farmers um, in New Jersey. Uh, the other programs we have are uh, local share where we glean from about 20 different farms in northern New Jersey and deliver that food to 90 different program food programs throughout northwest New Jersey for people in need. Uh, we have a food hub pilot as well um, that we created last year. Uh, that food hub program uh, gleans, uh, buys from uh, area farmers in Northwest New Jersey, and we deliver it to area places in Newark and Patterson. So thank you so much. I'm gonna turn it over to, uh, to Greg Soha from, from, the, uh, um, from the, the, the Trust for Public Lands. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Uh, yeah, Greg Soha here. I'm with the Trust for Public Land. Uh, we're a not-for-profit not organization that uh, creates park and protects land for people. We've been doing that in New Jersey uh, for the past 30 plus years. Um, and uh, I'm really excited uh, for this program uh, because we at the Trust for Public Land have, have uh, seen that access, equitable access to, to food has become more and more important to our communities in, in New Jersey. And we've been lucky to support um, uh, you know, some uh, mechanisms to create better access to uh, uh, food in communities, particularly around uh, community garden and, and local farming. Uh, so really excited to hear this. And, and, and I'm, I'm doubly uh, pleased that we could be part of promoting this because I'm also on the board of Grow Green. So I'm really excited for Farmer Sean to, to share his stories and experiences with you all. And um, I will, I'll throw it to Carla. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. Again, my name is Carla Robinson and I'm the part-time executive director of United Parks as One. United Parks as One is a citywide alliance of neighborhood-based park, playground and garden advocates dedicated to creating, maintaining and activating open spaces for the benefit of Newark residents and communities. UPAO envisions, envisions empowered and sustainable park playground and garden communities that offer safe spaces for artistic expression, economic advancement, educational programs, environmental appreciation and stewardship, healthy living, and spiritual renewal for all age groups. Our Park Ranger Summer Environmental Enrichment Program is a six-week program for Newark youth. Rangers help maintain Newark parks. The program features career education sessions and field trips focused on conservation and sustainability. Last year, we offered the program virtually for the very first time. 
In 2008, United Parks is one was one of the first community led national night out events in Newark. Um, and we held that at Nat Turner Park. That national annual event promotes positive relationships between communities and public safety agencies. Each year we sponsor that event at three Newark parks. We canceled the 2020 events because during the pandemic, Newark parks have, been, have not been available for large gatherings. The United Parks is one small grants program awards grants for $200 to $500 to community groups that sponsor events at the parks. This year, we're providing monetary and in-kind grants to organizations that are helping Newark residents during the pandemic. Our priorities include organizations providing needed goods and services to residents who cannot afford them, programs for school children, and organizations that have limited access to other sources of funding. We're also donating face masks to other community-based organizations so they can distribute them to the people they serve. We're happy about our new partnership with the New Jersey Highlands Coalition. At our February meeting, Julia Summers and Elliot Ruga presented the Highlands Rediscovered film and led a lively discussion about Newark's connections to the region. We're looking forward to continuing and deepening this new partnership. Now I'll turn it back over to Elliot. Thank you, Carla, and thank you, Greg and Eric. Uh, thanks for uh, helping spread the word about tonight's program. And we have a very interesting program tonight with two individuals from two organizations who are doing very good things here in the Highlands with um, the Food Shed Alliance and in Newark with uh, Tobias Fox in Newark Science and Sustainability. So first up, Grow It Green Morristown has been serving the region, its region for over 10 years now with the urban farm at Hazel Street in Morristown and the Early Street Community Garden also in Morristown and the greenhouse at St. Elizabeth U uh, University providing a CSA, a market stand, school programming and much, much more. Sean Inanko is the Director of Agriculture and Education. He's, the nater, he's a native of Morristown and has many years experience with um, health foods, CSA operations, and a degree in agriculture. So um, Sean, tell us about what's going on at Grow It Green these days. Sounds good, thanks Elliot. So thank you for having me. And let me tell you a little bit about Grow Green Morristown. So our mission is committed to fostering environmental sustainability, inspiring behaviors that contribute to healthy environment communities. We provide green spaces for gardening, gathering, educational programs, and equal access to fresh food. Through our three project sites, we fulfill this mission. The Early Street Community Garden is where the organization was founded in 2009. And then in 2010, um, the founders started the Urban Farm, which is, a one, which is now a one acre education farm. Um, slash production farm for the Marstown community. And uh, about four years ago, we partnered with um, St. Elizabeth University to um, use their greenhouse that they were underutilizing, which really helped us bring us to where we are today. So a little history of where we came from. Um, these three wonderful women, Myra, Carol, and Samantha, um, had an idea of starting a, gar a community garden and bringing people together around a common interest of growing and eating healthy. So they identified two places in Marstown and around that time. And in 2009, we started the community garden. And boy, did it not look like it does in this picture you see in front of you today. Um, the community garden, the early street community garden was in an abandoned junkyard site um, and a redevelopment zone and was slated to have a new building put on top of it. However, the women, the founders decided, well, why don't we approach the landowner and see if we can utilize the space while they wait to sell the property? So the landowner said yes, and um, the founders got community members and volunteers and neighborhood partners to clean up the site and install 20 garden beds. So our 20 garden plots were started out very grassroots in the beginning. People just walking by and helping out, asking what we were doing, um, said we were starting a community garden. Um, they helped out that day. And then that's how we filled those first garden beds. Um, if we jump forward to 2014, 
we were able to start transforming this garden. We worked with the Trust for Public Land, Green Acres Funding, the town of Mar and the town of Marstown um, to purchase the property and preserve it as public park space. Grow Green then started a capital campaign to raise over three hundred thousand dollars to transform those um, twenty garden beds into um, ninety-two garden beds and adding many different sustainable features um, that you can see here in this drawing. We have over 100 different families that garden there now. We installed two rain gardens on site, a uh, solar powered community pavilion, uh, a walking path that circles the garden and a public parklet that's planted in native plant species. Um, the walking path is beautiful, allowing people to enjoy the garden and in the many neighborhoods, um, people you know walking their dog and enjoying the green space that we created. Um, we have a rain cistern, which we collect water from that pavilion, um, which collects a lot of water, and we, where gardeners were able to use it to garden their water beds in the early part of the seasons. And then in the future, we hope to um, use that for future um, native plant species um, installations and um, irrigate those crops or those plants from the rainwater. Um, we, the rain garden was really important for this property. Um, this property is a low part of downtown Marstown and it collects a lot of water. And I can remember in the early years, um, before we had transformed the garden, the back part of the property flooded quite often. So with these two rain gardens, we're able to divert the water um, during heavy rainstorms and then, you know, slowly <clears throat> recharge our groundwater aquifers while also pulling toxins and heavy metals out of the water um, instead of just letting that water rush into downtown streams. Um, we had we purchased um, recyclable reusable furniture for people to enjoy the public parklet in the front um, and in the beautiful space that the garden has to offer. Um, the native plant species that were chosen are there to create um, beneficial insect habitats and also allow a beautiful nature design there at the, gar at the garden. Um, over 13 years ago, I started this career through um, becoming a beekeeper, and I'm happy to continue to uh, have those bees still at the community garden, providing pollination services for the gardeners and also delivering some sweet, delicious honey. Um, the solar power pavilion in the back um, offers a space for people to recharge electronics. And then in the future, we'll, we'll work, we'll service those pumps um, that we'll put into that rain garden. So being sustainable as we possibly can over there. Um, the community garden has really flourished into what it is today, um, providing garden spaces and community building opportunities for all walks of life. And it is a beautiful part of downtown Marstown. <clears throat> so the urban farm, which was started in 2010, is where we primarily work and um, where a lot of our sustainable features and sustainable farming comes from. Um, we took this under this former playground at the Lafayette Learning Center, which is the preschool for the Mars School District, as well as the um, as well as the administration. Um, so this half acre lot, which we started out with, so this blue line that you see here on the screen is where the farm started in 2010, and it was a very simple idea of just <coughs> excuse me. Um, we're just going to grow some food. We're going to teach some kids about where their food comes from and um, see where it goes from there. Well, it has grown into much more than just that. Um, and while also, off, also offering that education and food access for people in need. Um, so the preschool, when the kids would come out in the beginning, it was very much um, very much like very simple, right? Preschool kids, we're gonna put a seed in the ground and sun, soil and water and oola, it grows. Um, however, anybody that gardens knows that it's not that simple and there's many complex levels into gardening. 
Um, but it would, but the community really enjoyed it and the school district saw value in it. And so over the years, we were able to do two different sets of expansions um, in 2015, uh, sorry, 2013, um, we received uh, generous donations from King Supermarket and Hampshire Real Estate Companies. And we expanded the farm off to the left, um, which put us over just under a third of an acre in cultivation. And then um, in 2017, we expanded to that little corner over there that put us a little bit over an acre in cultivation. So this allowed us to increase the amount of food that we um, were able to donate to local food pantries and soup kitchens, and also increase the amount of students that we saw on the farm. So to where we are today, um, we are able to serve pre-K all the way up through 12th and college level students to teach them the importance of healthy eating and food access and just where your food comes from and the joy of uh, putting a plant in the ground and seeing what happens and how delicious fresh food can taste. Um, so a lot of our practices are done with regenerative farming, um, regenerative farming organic practices. So my main thing is that if you build healthy soil, you'll get healthy plants and then you get healthy humans. Um, so I'm gonna talk about how we do that on our farm. So all of our farm, beds are set up in 30 inch raised bed systems with walking paths in between. And we maximize the space that we use within those 30, that 30 inch bed. Um, we start with reduced tillage. So in the picture you see up on the left, that's a broad fork. Uh, we use that to aerate and break, um, we use that to aerate the soil without disturbing the soil food web that we've established below the lower six inches of the soil. Um, so which that does is it increases um, soil microbes. So we have like, we'll have more warm worms in the soil. We'll have more mycorrhizal fungi activities um, and we'll have a healthier community of nutrients that then can help feed the plants, the, feed the plants through their roots and also improves our water holding capacity so that during like heavy rainstorms or when we're irrigating, we're actually utilizing the water that, um, that we're putting down. And then during heavy rainstorms, we're not, not much of that water is actually washing off the farm. The soil is able to absorb it, hold on to it, and then provide the plants as they need it. So, you know, I would say like 25% of the work that we're doing is just moving compost around. Um, we have a small flock of chickens that help produce some compost for us. So all of our um, farm waste that we create um, gets fed to the chickens and then they'll decompose it, they'll scratch it, um, turn it into compost for us, and then we'll move it out of the chicken coop, um, let it sit for six to nine months, and then reapply it onto the field. However, that doesn't meet any of the demand of compost that we need on our farm. So we get mushroom compost um, shipped in from a local um, landscaper, which then we'll apply on a farm bed every time we turn over a bed. So really we try to maximize our space on the farm, refeed that soil so that when we plant our next crop, we're able, they have, the crop has what it needs to take off and then provide food for our local community. So cover cropping is a big part of our crop rotation um, systems. Um, we just focus on two types, which are oats and peas. Um, that works for our system. It's, it's easy to break down with our walk behind tractor and our farm hand tools, um, while also providing important nutrients to the soil and, and building up that organic matter so that we have um, healthier soil. However, like we don't, since our farm is so small, uh, we're not able to like cover crop the whole farm and we don't have the luxury of putting a section of the farm out of production for a whole season. Um, so what we'll do is like over a three year crop rotation cycle, um, each section of the farm will get cover cropping in the fall, 
Um, however, we don't leave any part of the farm bare. So if it doesn't get a cover cropping, it's going to have, um, we'll either put leaves that are supplied by the school or the town, or we'll get mulch hay and cover it that way, um, which then also will help determine um, our crop rotation for the next season on what crops will go in early and which crops will go in later. Um, so our integrated pest management um, method is just to mimic nature. So how best can we create an ecosystem on our farm that um, has the good bugs that are eating the bad bugs? And where can we make those habitats for them so that they thrive, um, so that we're getting, um, we're getting healthy crops and then we're also having this biodiversity on our farm. Um, one way we were gonna do that is that we plant uh, a lot of pollinator friendly plants um, along most of the border of the farm from the picture you saw before. And we also interspace flowers throughout the farm to, to attract certain insects that will help mitigate our pest damage. <clears throat> so, um, an example, you know, an example is that like we'll plant sweet alyssum um, near our lettuce crops, which then attract like a parasitic wasp that help um, reduce the amount of aphid pressure that we would have on our plants. Um, yeah. So then we also are heavy in our um, intercropping uh, to create more biodiversity within the crop fields. So in our thirty-inch sec. 30 inch raised beds, no, no crop is getting planted just solely by itself. Everything's gonna have some kind of companion with it to um, help build up that diversity and also help us maximize the amount of um, our yields and space. So um, one of my favorite ones that we do very often and um, is, is we plant radishes with carrots. And um, a lot of my CSA members kind of complain about how many radishes they get. Um, because of this, but um, we do get delicious carrots. So the reason I plant those two together is um, radishes germinate really quickly. For two, two, three days during the peak of the summer, those guys are going to pop up and um, put out their leaves and start shading the soil, um, which then gives the time for the carrots. We like to take a little bit of time um, while they're growing. So a carrot takes about maybe two weeks to germinate. So the reduced weed pressure that I have on my carrots, I get very good germination that way. And then I'm also getting two crops out of that section. So when we're done harvesting radishes at the end of a month period time, um, now we have a beautiful bed of carrots left behind that will then, um, then we'll get to harvest over the course of two months. And then when those carrots are done, uh, we'll go back to square one, put that compost down, lightly till it into the soil, and then uh, follow it with lettuce. Um, lettuce, and then and the picture here, you see lettuce and scallions. I also do that type of rotation with, um, with beets. I find that you can, in a 30 inch raised bed, you can do three rows of beets um, with two rows of scallions in between those. Um, Scallions not needing a lot of sunlight to grow um, or space so that, um, you know, those beets, they fill out, they shade the soil, again, reducing my weed pressure. Uh, and then over the course of two months while I'm harvesting those beets, um, by the time uh, we're down to our last harvest, we're harvesting all of the beets and the scallions are ready to come out. And we have, um, you know, a nice, we're, we're building up on our diversity of what we have to offer to at our farm stand and donate to local food pantries and then also to our CSA members. So this is, ties into like succession cropping, which is really important on a small farm, how the size that we have. So, you know, a lot of our plants are planted on two week or three week intervals so that we have a continuous supply of vegetables throughout the season. And like, we really focus on the short growing crops along with some of the favorites, but we do stay away from some of the bigger crops like potatoes and winter squashes and corn because 
they do take up a lot of space and they take a long time to come to maturity. So we wanna maximize our space with crops that grow quickly and um, also our crops that people enjoy. So we still do tomatoes and peppers, and eggplants, um, who wouldn't in New Jersey, but um, we do a heavy focus on greens and quick root vegetables. Um, so every two weeks we're planting lettuce heads out in the field and um, every three weeks we're doing um, our beets and our radishes. Um, and then so then as those crops as those crops are harvested and a bed is empty, they're getting rotated in with something else that's timely for that time of year. So, you know, rotations of crops is really important. Um, however, it's not as simple for our farm as it would be for a larger farm. Um, you know, larger farms or urban or or urban farms that are you know, more rectangular or square, um, you can really block out that space and say, you know, my 80 feet of tomatoes can just move over to block B um, because I'm still gonna grow 80 feet of tomatoes. Um, the picture you saw, we, we have lots of triangles on our farm, which makes it very beautiful and unique. Um, but then I also have to, you know, I've created a very complicated spreadsheet where I can figure out like what section of the farm I, and how many beds I need to use up to then get that yield number that I'm looking for in certain crops. And then it also like, if I want to increase yields, where do I have to shift um, vegetables around to um, get, that, get that potential and get that yield potential out of them? Um, doesn't mean that I take crops away. It's just, I have to get very creative with our crop rotation schedule. So um, I don't necessarily follow like the heavy feeder, heavy giver, light feeder. It's just like, where can I put it that it wasn't there last year, but still have the same amount as I did before. Um, we're really lucky to have water provided by the school. Um, however, we wanna be as conservative with it as possible. So about 90, I would say 90% of our farm is irrigated with drip irrigation. Um, so you see these strips, these black strips, there are little slits every six inches. And so we're watering right at the root zone of the plant. And we can also use um, timers and technology to then um, time the amount of time that we're irrigating the crops and what time of the day that we're actually doing it as well. So I can set these timers to turn it on at five o'clock in the morning um, and you know, run for three hours and then turn off. And then so all I, all of our, all the staff needs to do and myself is just to look out for leaks to make sure like a, a line didn't get, um, didn't blow out or we didn't like put a slit in a line when we were harvesting one day. Um, so this really helps with our water conservation as well. Um, watering right at the root zone of the plant, and then also not using an overhead sprayer where you might lose a lot of water for evaporation. Um, and it's also healthier for the plant, so you're not getting so much heavy water pellets on top of the leaves. Um, and we do use some overhead sprayers. Um, that's mostly for our root vegetables to get the germination going, um, but they are, um, they're monitored more frequently. So about three years ago is when we started really implementing these regenerative farming practices, you know, really building up our soil health, setting up these systems where, you know, these 30 inch raised beds were throughout the farm um, and figuring out how to do all of this intercropping. So last year we did over 23,000 pounds of produce entirely, um, which was a 20% increase from the year before. And then you can see 160% increase over the past three years. Um, so it's really like, if you put the effort into growing that healthy soil um, and, and you're on top, if you're harvesting and you're cropping, you can really produce a lot of food for your community on a very small space. Um, and then this year we're, you know, had dreams to even grow even more than we did the year before. So, um, you know, farming is always learning and uh, 
trial and error and then learning which crops go together really well and then also um you know learning which ones didn't do so well taking notes of that and then applying that for the following year um so we are also a four season farm i had four of these tunnels on our property um these two are our longer ones that are 48 feet long and then we also have two that are 25 feet long um in the winter time uh as long as we get our plants planted um before we start losing that sunlight and they're mature uh we can harvest them throughout the winter uh we harvest about once a month and then we'll bring them um to local food pantries and then also we'll bring them to the winter farmers market that we host uh so you can see here we're in here harvesting beautiful radishes and we have lettuce planted with scallions and a wonderful crop of spinach and this harvest was in january and i just finished um harvesting this tunnel um this past week so now it is empty and it's ready to get turned over um we're going to do a trial of carrots um and see if we can't push those carrots a little early and then what it'll follow behind that will be um uh, planting a bok choy and bell peppers and then once that bok choy comes out we'll plant basil in there and then th throughout the summertime we'll be able to harvest our our basil and our bell peppers in this tunnel and so here's a picture of the farm just in its peak from a drone shot um and you can see as i was saying before like all those these fun little triangles that i have to work with um but we are able to create a really functioning farm from it so the saint elizabeth university greenhouse is um when we made this partnership it really um was what made this production be able to happen. Like before that, um, I would start most of the transplants in the basement of my house. Um, and then um, when it got kind of warm enough, I would take one of those tunnels and turn that into a mock greenhouse, which meant that I couldn't be growing any vegetables in there in the ground. So I'd have to set up all these tables and I would um, drag in space heaters so that, um, you know, I could keep the tunnel warm enough. And then on days like today, or, or a week like today, where we have this weird um, temperature spike, then there would be like a fire alarm goes off and you have to roll up all the sides and make sure everything's staying hydrated um, so that they don't get shocked. And then um, tomorrow is gonna drop back down to regular temperature. So this greenhouse being a place where we can monitor the temperature and really keep everything healthy, um allows us to you know provide for the farm the way it needs to be and we're in there now getting started um which seems like we're already behind but we're not um and everything really comes together quickly uh so yeah so grow green marstown hosts uh, a winter farmers market um at the mars museum um we're behind the museum on the back um parking lot and there's a variety of great vendors. If you haven't been there yet, um, please stop by. Um, I'll be there this weekend selling vegetables, um, as long selling vegetables along with a lot of other people. We have bread vendors, cheese vendors, um, people selling kombucha and all kinds of things. So if you haven't been, please come. Um, we're, we extended the market and so we're going all the way to the end of April this year. Um, so back to our farm based education, um, <clears throat> you know, this is really where the urban farm started uh, and how we're able to like really like connect with students and, you know, build this community around, you know, food and produce and being outside and understanding what's happening in nature. Uh, so our farm educator, Farmer Tina, um, did a wonderful job this year pivoting into creating wonderful virtual lessons for our students. Um, but then in pre and then previous years, uh, we would be busing kids um, from April all the way to June. 
Uh, so we developed a program that works with all the second graders in the Mars School District uh, to come out to the farm. We do taste tests with them. We run activities that um, you know teach them about where their food comes from, the importance of healthy eating, and then just being outside and learning um, and seeing like, I'm gonna put this little plant in the ground and it's gonna turn into something that I can eat. And then also, you know, having an older plant for them to try, be like, oh, I just planted kale, but I have kale that I overwintered so they get to taste um, what that's going to taste like. Um, and we were, so, and it, it's just, it's just so great to see those kids so excited to try a piece of spinach or to pull a carrot out of the ground and be really excited about it. And we still have the preschoolers coming out because they're right on site. So um, just today they were out there, you know, go look at the chickens. And then they have a wonderful time just, you know, staring at the chickens and making noises. Uh, this year we were able to get a grant and then we developed um, a hydroponic system for the STEM students at Marstown High School for, for their freshmen, um, which was really wonderful um, to work with the teachers, to create this curriculum, um, create a spreadsheet where the students will then track um, the data, you know, how big their plant is growing, how much nutrients they're putting in. And then over the course of 15 weeks, they'll have all this data and they'll be able to, you know, you know, plug it in and then, you know, create a chart and then also have something from it. So a lot of the students have been able to grow these really beautiful lettuce and basil plants that we provided for them. Um, we do cafeteria taste tests and we'll bring those back as soon as we can. And then um, I have a backyard gardening series that I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, so here, here's Farmer Tina doing an educational lesson. I think it was about what lives on a farm. Um, so they would you know, ask the question, what lives on the farm? Well, a farmer lives on the farm. So they get a little picture of a farmer and then put it up on that felt. And then what else lives on a farm? And there were, you know, chickens or vegetables and they went through the process and they had a really great time. And so even in these COVID times, we're still trying to get these kids out there and excited. Um, so I've been saying before that we donate to local food pantries, the Interfaith Food Pantry, Table of Hope, Nourish NJ, and the Atlantic Health Family Counseling and Guidance Program. So last year we donated 8,800 pounds of produce. Um, which then uh, this wonderful volunteer here delivers that for us um, in her van um, weekly. Um, and we really enjoy being able to provide fresh produce to those who want it most. Um, staying before, we have a farm stand that we host on Saturdays. Um, we do have a CSA, unfortunately it's sold out for the season. So I um, encourage anybody that's interested in um, seeing the farm and uh, trying our produce, uh, please come out during our farm stand, which starts June 12th. Um, and we are affordable and we also offer snap benefits. Um, so many hands make light work. So even in these times, um, we still need volunteers out on the farm, um, especially right now as we're trying to get the farm started. So please um, go to our website and click on a sign up genius link. Um, we are doing small sections of people to be socially distanced and safe. Um, <clears throat> and, and then just come out and get your hands dirty. You know, learn a little bit about um, our farming practices and go home with some produce and, um, you know, enjoy the outside and the nature. So over the years, we've been working with the high school. Um, we're really happy to be able to offer internships for high school students and college students um, to really just show them like how much, what, how different a job can be and how much fun it can be working outside. Even on the hottest days of the year, um, we're still out there laughing, enjoying, um, you know, and, and harvesting food and, <clears throat> and then just learning and they get the whole sense of like the they may not all take up all of the practices that we're doing but they do see like what happens like if I put when I put the lettuce in the ground and then when I'm harvesting it and they, there is a sense of accomplishment with that we have two really great events coming up 
on March 19th and 20th, we have our virtual fundraiser, uh, Spring Into Action. We have a lot of great silent auction items for you guys and along with meal kits and wine pairing. Um, so please go to our website. It's free to register um, and it really helps us um, be able to provide all of what we've been doing for the Marstown community as well as a seedling sale. So a lot of those plants that we grow in the greenhouse, um, we offer to the community to start their own gardens at home. Um, a platform will be launched at the end of the month where you can um, create your own shopping cart and I'll tend to those little plants for you guys. And then on Saturday, May 15th, you can come to the farm and pick them up and start your own garden at home. And then I also, um, if anybody is questioning starting a garden or is interest or started one last year and you know wants to learn a little bit more about how to tend to their raised bed or their backyard garden, um, I have a series here. And our first class is March 23rd. And that's all about seed starting, um, making a raised bed, uh, what to put in your soil, and um, how to tend and how to plant your crops once they're ready to go. So I thank you all for listening and I hope you enjoyed um, my presentation. Uh, please follow us on Facebook and Instagram. And I look forward to answering your questions at the end of this webinar. Thank you, everyone. As an, as an urban farmer, you really have to be uh, thoughtful about leveraging the interdependence of natural systems to have a successful farm. For the next, for the next segment, we will take urban agriculture to another level in a far more densely populated location in New Jersey's largest city, Newark. Sean, please stick around for the Q&A and audience members, please hold on to your questions for Sean um, after we speak with Tobias Fox, who is the managing director of Newark Science and Sustainability, New Jersey, which implements various initiatives to increase awareness of environmental issues through educational programs and hands-on training. The organization strives to assist with the creation of self-sustaining communities by developing pathways for green jobs that contribute to self-sufficiency and community empowerment. They achieve this by partnering with residents, <clears throat> community-based organizations, and stakeholders, including local businesses. And some of their uh, recent initiatives, which sound very interesting, is uh, a farm to table co op, a sustainability um, ambassadors program. Um, they, um, they hold a sustainable living empowerment conference. It looks like you do a lot of exciting stuff, Tobias. So tell us what you do. <laughs> okay. Um, I want to just uh, jump right into uh, the presentation. According to scientific reports, climate change is one of the most crucial concerns that will determine the fate of human survival. Reported by a variety of New Jersey news sources, the effects of Hurricane Sandy in New Jersey in 2012 were severe, with economic losses uh, to businesses of up to $30 billion. Over 2 million households across the state lost power during the storm. 346,000 homes were damaged or destroyed, and 37 people were killed. In the United States, the Environmental Protection Agency estimates that more food reaches landfills and incinerators than any other single material in our everyday trash. By keeping wholesome and nutritious food in our communities and out of landfills, we can help address the 42 million Americans that live in food insecure households. This would also have a tremendous impact on our climate. Roughly 44.2% of New Jersey's urban children, ages 3 to 18, are overweight or obese. Causes include poor nutrition education coupled with food deserts. These are areas that lack access to healthy food, a predominant issue in minority and low income neighborhoods. So Newark is the largest populated and second culturally diverse city in New Jersey. Newark is also burdened with an array of socioeconomic and environmental challenges with 70% of the city being paid contributing to stormwater runoff, leaving some neighborhoods flooded. As a major transit hub and port city, 
residents have asthma rates over 25%. Studies reveal that less than one fifth of Newark's children meet recommendations for vegetable intake. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. stated that life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? I honestly never saw the work I do as social and environmental activism, at least not until I began to learn about food justice, the belief that healthy food is a human right. So everyone has an inherent right to access healthy, fresh food. I also didn't know that this human right was something in many communities you have to fight for. Since 2013, with little to no financial resources, we've managed to make an impact in our community by implementing various initiatives to increase awareness of environmental, ecological, and wellness issues through educational programs and hands-on activities. We achieve this through collaborations and partnerships with residents, community-based organizations, and other key stakeholders, including local businesses. It is through our five pillars that initiatives and programs are formed, making us a highly project-driven organization. Our pillars provide an interdisciplinary approach to learning. Through this process, we believe individuals will become more informed about their environment and therefore more likely to have a holistic understanding of themselves and the world they inhabit. It's important to note that community agriculture lay the foundation of our work. We rely strongly on collaborative partnerships to help us achieve our goals. Our renewable energy program introduced practical uses of solar, wind, pedal bike generators, and energy storage or battery pack. Participants also become better informed about climate issues and how to be more climate resilient as they make, um, excuse me, as they implement renewable energy into their community. In this photo, you see me making smoothies from the power that's being created by the pedal bike, which we call our pedal bike powered smoothie bar. Eco art is the use of natural and recycled materials to create, enhance, and interact with the environment. Participants are introduced to eco art as a means for self expression, beautification, and personal engagement and connection with the natural world. Through this initiative, we are able to integrate art with urban agricultural practices and community engagement. Art Grows in Newark is a program that grew out of our Eco Art Initiative. Focusing on ages four and five-year-olds, Art Grows in Newark integrates visual arts and art therapy with urban agricultural practices in order to foster environmental stewardship, strong community engagement, and a culture of hope, and social change. Our wellness and nutrition program involve nutritional education and events in which participants engage in nutritional food and information. The Healing Properties of Herbs is a, is a workshop that grew out of our wellness and nutrition initiative. In this workshop, we, uh, we review common herbs that are grown indoors, outdoors, or can be found in almost everyone's kitchen and learn about their effect on the body and how to use them. The workshop includes a hands-on do-it-yourself component in which participants create and take home an herbal remedy for their own personal use. Our ecological building program examines ecological construction and other building methods that operates within the laws of nature and advocates for the use of local portable materials. In this, 2022 development project. We use the name Ashe, excuse me, the name Ashe as an acronym for art, science, horticulture, and education. Ashe is a West African philosophical, philosophical concept through which the Yoruba of Nigeria conceived the power to make things happen and produce change. It is often summarized as so be it. So it is or so mote it be. Also, Aisha is a Hebrew name that means doctor or healer. So here you have a three-story facility with a cafe style farmer's market at the lower level, then shared office space, then apartments at level three and a green booth. 
This is a 2023 development project. This energy demonstration space will enable us uh, with the ability to provide the community with resources needed to provide job training and educate residents on the use of renewable energy and create employment opportunities. This is an urban farm project that we are currently developing in North. We will begin the construction this month. It will become our headquarters and an agricultural hub center. This is in fact, the, the redevelopment of our Garden of Hope. We're now working on transforming it into a year round sustainable urban farm. It will be the first of its kind in North. We'll have an administration facility with a restroom, a walk-in cooler to store produce, a farm stand to sell our produce and other value added products, a tool shed, an outdoor kitchen, a hydroponic greenhouse where we'll be collecting uh, rainwater um, to feed the greenhouse. Uh, we'll also have a chicken coop. Uh, we'll also be, um, we'll have some solar technology to help offset some of our energy costs. We recently lost, launched a, a capital funding campaign to help us raise the $2,000 uh, needed to complete the construction and hire staff to ensure we're sustainable for the next four years. So urban agriculture, the localization of food production, which mostly consists of transforming vacant lots or warehouses into community gardens or urban farms. Operating through the city of Newark's Adopt-A-Lot program, we're able to adopt uh, vacant lots like the one you see here from the city of North for $1 and renew the lease annually. The purpose of adopting these lots is to transform them into a green space for community use. This lot is adjacent to a childhood learning center. And when my colleague learned that there was very few green spaces for them to visit in this neighborhood, we adopted this lot in 2015 and transformed it into the Garden of Hope. It is our belief that gardens in and of themselves are the real life symbols of hope. Our gardens invigorate people's senses during the day-to-day -day hustle and bustle. We've been able to transform abandonment into sustainability. The gardens become a gathering place where strangers become friends and to ponder their thoughts amongst the beauty of the garden. Through our urban agriculture initiative, participants learn the art of gardening and farming in urban environments. Our focus areas include plant management, produce distribution, and increasing residents' access to healthy food. I wanna take a moment to talk about water. I should say the source of life. When I first started doing this work in 2012, I didn't realize the importance of water. But after witnessing a dying garden, I learned quickly. Thankfully in Newark, we developed a healthy relationship with the Newark's fire department, who, uh, we can contact and schedule appointments for weekly garden visits. They'll actually fill up our water tanks or rain barrels and also uh, water the garden. We also create rainwater catchment systems and collect rainwater from the rooftops of adjacent facilities. <clears throat> In 2018, we launched our farm to table co-op, which follows the model of a community supported agriculture or CSA program. A system in which a farm operation is supported by shareholders within the community. Individuals are able to make an advance payment of $395 to receive weekly fresh locally grown produce packages, feeding two to four people for 20 weeks. That's from June to October. There are those who find $395 to be a financial burden. So we launched our Sponsor of Family Initiative, which allows people from anywhere to purchase a membership and then donate it to a family in need. The sponsor's membership ensures that fresh, healthy food reaches the tables of those residing in neighborhoods throughout North that has no reliable access to a, a sufficient quantity of affordable, nutritious food. We've partnered with community-based organizations that provide health and social services throughout the community to help identify families in need. Individuals could either choose a full membership for $395 or a partial membership for $200 which provides produce packages for 10 weeks. With the redevelopment of the Garden of Hope, it would allow us to expand our farm to table co-op from 20 members and support up to 50 families. 
here are uh, two community gardens during the peak season, which with members from our farm to table co-op. There's also our sustainability ambassador program geared towards ages, uh, youth ages 11 to 18. Sustainability ambassadors help promote sustainable living practices such as healthy eating, active living, urban farming, and clean energy in their homes, faith organizations, schools, and other networks to which they may belong. The program runs for five weeks over the, the summer and the ambassadors engage in a wide variety of hands-on learning activities, including field trips uh, that are focused on our five pillars. Through the solicitation of donations and grants, the program is free and lunch is also provided. Working in collaboration with Whole Cities Foundation, Newark Science and Sustainability Inc. functions as the Newark Community Food System Facilitation and Support Team. By stringing together a network of Newark-based growers, the Newark Community Food System, or NCFS, an innovative collective of local urban agriculture experts, supports the growth of the local food system, amplify community-led initiatives, and develop sustainability around urban agriculture and fresh, healthy food access. NCFS takes actionable steps to empower residents to become actively involved in shaping their food system while gaining control of their health and environment. Throughout the year, we conduct sign three signature events. Each event focuses on sustainable living practices and the impact of urban agriculture. These events highlight organizations throughout the local community to promote local action and involvement. So we have two working groups within uh, the North Community Food System. One is the Land Tenure Working Group. The purpose of this working group is to advocate for the long-term sustainability of gardens and or urban farms across the city of Newark. This working group also serves as an active and relevant resource for those who are seeking to transition from leaseholder to landowner for the purpose of providing residents with more access to fresh locally grown produce and hands-on learning activities. The second uh, working group is our signature, signature events working group, which is to assist with the strategic planning, budgeting, and organizing of our annual signature events. And I'll share briefly those three signature events. The first is our, <clears throat> excuse me, the uh, annual Sustainable Living Empowerment Conference. I almost forgot the title for a moment. <laughs> the purpose of the Sustainable Living Empowerment Conference is to inspire and empower attendees so they become active participants toward the goal of building healthy, sustainable communities. The speakers use their own experiences and values to convey how they have been driven by their passions to various achievements. Just as in 2020, this year's conference will be hosted virtually, given our current situation with COVID-19. But from previous uh, conferences, uh, from urban farming to health and wellness, the speakers share information and experiences that assist with the creation of sustainable communities. Our week-long garden tour provides an opportunity for residents and visitors to become more informed about the various agricultural spaces that exist throughout North. This event also serves as a means to encourage healthy eating, healthy living practices, and environmental education. Through a series of workshops and reaping the benefits from the harvest of each of the participating spaces, residents walk away with healthy, locally grown produce and a broader awareness of environmental stewardship. Here are a series of activities occurring at a few of the gardens during the garden tour. We have yoga in the garden, an herbalism workshop, harvesting, potluck, and hands-on learning activities for youth. By working in collaboration with the Urban Agriculture Cooperative, we not only demonstrate how agriculture contributes to the health and well-being of communities, but also the local economy, which is why we help facilitate these pop-up farm stands and farmers markets. And our third signature event is a community meal. 
This community mill was set up for 200 residents in this North neighborhood to come out of their homes, engage with one another, and indulge in topics related to their environmental and social issues. Much of the food was donated from the gardens and urban farms throughout North. This mill was, was accompanied by sustainable living vendors and light entertainment. I have to add that this event is also zero waste, meaning that residents are required to bring their own utensils, plates, and cups. Unfortunately, due to COVID-19, last year and this year's event is organized as a farmer's market set up with pre-prepared grab-and-go meals. And our most recent initiative is based in Constanza, Dominican Republic, a town also described as the agricultural capital of the country. Action Global is a nonprofit organization established by North Science and Sustainability. Its mission is to empower communities with environmental education, facilitate the cultivation of organic agriculture, provide nutrition education, and create pathways of sustainable lifestyles and green jobs. Here is an herbalism workshop we facilitated in July, 2020. There is a community uh, meeting we facilitated in November, 2020, uh, following uh, the uh, cultivation of a community garden. Richard Buck, Mr. Bucky Fuller, who was an American architect, system theorist, author, designer, designer and inventor stated that, in order to change an existing paradigm, you do not struggle and try to change the problematic model. You create a new model and make the old one obsolete. That, in essence, is the highest service to which we are all being called. And Jock Fresco, who was an American social engineer and founder of the Venus Project, stated that if you think we can't change the world, it just means you're not one of those that will. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Tobias. I'm, I'm really excited that so much good stuff is going on in Newark. Um, I'm curious, NCFS, I've, I've already forgotten what, what the acronym stands North, North for. North Community Food System, yes, NCFS. And, and the Urban <laughs> Agricultural Co Cooperative. How many groups in Newark are, are independently doing urban agriculture and, and, and I guess, large scale gardening? So uh, there were uh, several groups doing it independently when I first started in, in 2012. And so being an organizer, um, uh, I, I would say in 2013, I started making attempts at uh, um, using an organizing approach towards community agriculture, getting more people more collectively engaged with one another, us working more closely together. But I, I have to give uh, Host Cities Foundation um, some of that credit because in 2017, uh, they approached me and said, Tobias, we want you to start working with um, one of the founders of the Urban Agriculture Cooperative, Emilio Panaski. And then, um, and so, that created uh, him and I to start working more closely together. And so, because Newark has a history of this like, you know, activism uh, history embedded in the fabric of the social system of Newark, it's, it, it becomes easy for a person who lives on one side of Newark and the other person that lives on the opposite side of Newark to, to come together at some point, uh, work together collectively, uh, because we all have a common interest, common goal. And so, uh, Great Newark Conservancy also has been collaborating with us uh, closely since uh, 2013. And so um, there is uh, several organizations um, that, uh, that are doing this work, but thankfully uh, we decided to come together and work collectively. And so North Community Food System or NCFS uh, it definitely is a demonstration of how we uh, use collaborative uh, means to um, achieve certain goals. Great, great. So Sean, why don't you come back with us? I, I see there's some questions that have been saved up for you um, that some members here would love to hear some responses. Um, well, th this question, this first question can go for either Tobias or Sean. Have either of your gardens seen an increase in interest as people strive to be more self-reliant or just have more time to devote to growing food. I don't, I don't know if this is in 
the context of COVID or just generally. But has there been an increase recently in um, uh, people striving to be more self-reliant or more time to follow this interest? So I, I, I'll, I'll let, I'm sure Sean has an has a, a answer to that, but I'll, I'll just jump in and say that. Um, so this work has been allowing me to kind of travel uh, across uh, the United States, um, especially in urban environments. And um, community engagement is definitely a common issue. And so, um, and so, uh, so community engagement is, is just tough. And so uh, because uh, this agriculture work is very labor intensive, uh, it requires you to have the time to do it as well. Um, and then you have people who uh, want to get paid for this labor intensive work, right? And so, um, um, and so because of COVID, there's been an increased interest, yes. Um, but we'll see, we'll see what this season looks like, you know? Um, there's definitely been an increase of, of interest and uh, we'll see how um, this, uh, this, how things go for this season. Okay. Sean, do you have a response? Yeah, um, we did see an increase, like our CSA membership um, sold out uh, very quickly in the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and then also halfway through the season, we were, our, our harvest and our yields were doing so well, we were able to offer like a, a fall share and that sold out within a couple of days. Uh, and then, yeah, we did like a lot of the gardeners in the beginning of the season uh, we're very eager to get started um, while we were trying to develop our safety protocols and um, and and our and our plant sales. Like we we have a lot of people in our neighborhoods in our community here that um, started their own gardens um, and then still visited the uh, farm stand to supplement what they were growing and ask questions. So I hope that continues. I mean, having your own garden is. So relaxing and uh, a great way to just get outdoors. Yeah. Um, well, some technical questions for you, Sean. Okay. Are you tilling or turning only the top six inches? Of your only plant? turning the top six inches, but I don't okay. go below that. Okay. And uh, also, Sean, did you have issues with the mushroom compost? One of our gardeners who used it had a problem with germination of vegetables? Uh, we don't have a problem. Um, that might be a source thing. Uh, we trust where we get our, our mushroom compost from, um, Country Mile Gardens. And, um, and it, it has always been um, pretty reliable. Um, um, one of our audience members, Steve, grew up in Newark and wants to know how many community gardens there are in the city. There is uh, been about an increase of uh, between 15 and 20 active uh, gardens uh, in the city of Newark. Um, and if you, I, and I, I keep a list, so I'm willing to share that list out with the contact information of all the different gardens that we have in Newark. Um, and within most of, most of those active uh, gardens or persons or people who help manage those gardens are actively involved in the NCFS North Community Food System as well. And so when we have the citywide garden tour, um, it's really cool because uh, the city becomes more alive uh, with uh, garden activities and this opportunity for people to kind of show off their spaces and get, hopefully get our visitors and, and more residents uh, more into those green spaces. So we're looking at between 15 and 20 active gardens. Or urban farms. Yeah. So Some this, people define uh, their spaces as an urban farm. Um, this is a question for uh, either of you or both of you. <clears throat> what suggestions would you give to someone that would love to do a community garden in their neighborhood, but uh, they have their time, they're, they're occupied nine to five in a standard job? Is that is it tenable? So, and then so that just goes to, um, you know, my point early on when, um, when you asked the question um, about engagement. And so, I mean, that's the reality. You know, people, you know, work and have other responsibilities, you know. And so, um, so there's been an increase of interest, people wanting to do it. You know, there's been 
people who uh, signed up for this year's uh, Adopt a Lot program. Um, but if you don't have the time to do it, then support others who do, right? And so uh, you have uh, growers like Sean and the organization he's with, you have uh, uh, urban agriculture community in Newark. Um, and, um, and so I'm an organizer. And so I'm always looking at ways of trying to help others uh, have access to fresh, healthy food, wherever they are, not just, they, they don't have to be in Newark. It's like, let's work together to, kind of, I see it as a movement. And so uh, if you can't do it yourself, latch on to others who have the time to do it. Okay. Um, Sean, you mentioned that most of the compost comes from a local landscaper. How do you ensure that the that grass clippings, leaves, and um, I guess matter that might contain chemicals like pesticides or herbicides are mixed in? I'm... Uh, we we've been working with them for uh, a number of years, so we just trust their source. Um, you know, ask them the questions like those, um, and then you know the answers are there's no herbicides, there's no pesticides. Um, it comes from um, mushroom farms out in Pennsylvania. So it's just, um, it's just a spent product from that operation. Um, and I mean, it does, you know, like there's like a, a plastic glove in there every once in a while, but it's not anything that we're worried about. Right. Okay. And Tobias does, um, um, do you say SAS or you, you say, say SAS? Does same SAS same. own the land? at the Garden of Hope or do you lease it from the city as part of a adopt a lot program? Um, and also what progress has been made in terms of helping urban, urban farmers gain more permanent access to land? Yeah, which is an so issue. it is. Um, and so, um, yeah, because some of us lost our gardens um, because of uh, land sales um, in the city of North, right? And so, uh, and we talk about sustainability. My question is, well, well, for how long? You know, are we talking about one year, two years, three years? And so um, I uh, was thankfully uh, landed into some funding that allowed me to uh, purchase the land that the Garden of Hope sits on. Um, and so I was able to acquire not just those two lots that the garden um, sits on, but also a third lot. And so I am within the North Community Food System or NCFS Collective, the first one that will be transitioning from leaseholder to landowner. And that's why we created this um, land tenure working group uh, because there's uh, several others who want to follow this lead uh, to secure the long-term long sustainability of their green spaces. Um, and we realized that the best way to do that is to transition ourselves from uh, leaseholders to landowners. Um, and then there's also, um, uh, this land bank that just was launched in the city of Newark to help increase more home ownership. And so this, you know, could be a, a somewhat of a threat for us because it's saying like, hey, you know, develop more land for, uh, for home ownership. And so this encourages us even more so to work even faster and harder to transition ourselves uh, and make our presence even more known uh, about what we want to do in the city of Newark. There was a second part to that, a loss, I'm sorry. To that um, question, I well, I guess the, the, I guess the first part was, <laughs> um, do you lease any land from the city? And so the, generally- Yeah, so the lease the is through- you out? So the, the, the lease comes through the city's Adopt-A-Lot program. So the Adopt-A-Lot program was uh, initiated through, uh, in, the, in the 90s, uh, through uh, Sharp James uh, administration. Uh, former mayor of North, and uh, it was not intended to like, you know, beautify or green North. It was to stop illegal dumping. It became a major issue in North, uh, illegal dumping. And so uh, they decided to uh, create and uh, implement this adopt a lot program to kind of temporarily allow residents to occupy the space as a way to deter illegal dumping. But the goal was to get those properties back on the city's uh, tax roll. And so, um, and then when um, uh, Senator Cory Booker became the mayor, uh, he kind of helped transform uh, the city's adopt a lot program by uh, creating a office of sustainability. And uh, that office of sustainability, they uh, 
did a, a, a great thing by um, lifting the burden of residents having to take out insurance for those uh, vacant lots to turn into gardens. Prior to um, Cory Booker's administration, you had to, as, an, as a resident individual, you had to take out insurance on the city property if you wanted to use it as a wow. garden. Yep, and then so, um, so um, Cory Booker's administration uh, lifted that burden. It allowed people like myself, you know, and others to participate more in the city's adopt a lot program. But again, the goal was, and it has always been to, uh, you know, you know, kind of have this kind of, uh, I, I call it a squatter's mentality, whereas though we get people to kind of babysit the property uh, until we're able to, to sell it, you know? And so, um, and so there was uh, an issue in 20, I think it was 2014 when uh, Ras Baraka, uh, his first term in office, he had a uh, Valentine's Day uh, vacant lot sale where for a thousand dollars, you can buy the lot for a thousand dollars with the promise of developing it. And um, it, it wasn't successful, um, but a lot of us, uh, or I should say several of us lost our gardens in that process, you know? And um, because it wasn't a successful program, uh, it got a lot of pushback um, where so now uh, we have some security of our lots not being um, stripped from us uh, in that way. Uh, but we know if we wanna protect it for long-term sustainability, we have to uh, transition ourselves from leaseholder to landowner. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds like it served the city and not net only temporarily served um, the community. Um, right. You know, I guess there's a dichotomy of the, the Phoenix rises for the city of Newark. So does the land values. And, and uh, then there's more interest in, 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 in making, you know, con doing more construction and um, not gardening. So there's, there's, a, there's some pressures there. Um, Tobias, are there any jobs you know of in Newark in the field of food justice? Uh, what what suggestions do you have for an aspiring food justice advocate? Right, that's a really good question, right? And so I, my educational background consists, and so I am in urban agriculture, right? and so I'm in I'm in the garden. Sometimes it's just me, you know, working and tilling and turning soil and everything, right? And so, but my educational background consists of creative writing, filmmaking, book publishing. I'm also a photographer. Um, I was 10 years of my life was book publishing, editing, ghost writing, co-authoring. So it wasn't until 2011 when I uh, kind of crashed and burnt out completely from that field and um, found myself uh, needing a place to live, sleeping on my cousin's couch that had no money coming in. Uh, collecting uh, food stamps or EBT as a way to feed myself and trying to figure out how do I reinvent myself from all this. And someone told me about a group of people who had marched on, on Wall Street in 2011, October, uh, demanding economic justice. And this is when I learned about it. And this was the birth of Occupy Wall Street. And so I went over into New York and learned more about this uh, short-lived movement but it became my inspiration because that was when I uh, started meeting rural and urban farmers, didn't know what an urban farmer was at that time. Started meeting um, solar uh, energy technicians, people who were transforming uh, the sun, wind, pedal bikes into energy. And so I got inspired by all that. And then when I heard about a small group of people starting Occupy North, I got involved in that and emerged as a lead organizer for Occupy North. I never saw myself doing the work that I do now. You know. Um, and so uh, I, then I became a healthcare organizer, organizing residents in Newark around their healthcare disparities. And then eventually decided to do the work that I'm doing now uh, full time in, in January, 2017. And so I'm all, I say all that to say is that sometimes we have to lead our own paths and create op career opportunities um, that we, are, we feel we are passionate about. And so um, there is no green collar industry yet, right? And so we have to create these opportunities. And so you have a person like Sean, you have a person like myself, um, where you can, that can, you can start a platform for yourself right here. And that's what I did. Right, well, as I always say, it's never too late to reinvent yourself, nor how many times you can do so in your lifetime. Oh, um, that's so true. So true. Sean, <laughs> question for you. What, what advice would you give an, an aspiring urban farmer 
uh, in terms of training, education, and experience? I would say just get out there and uh, start doing it. Um, there are lots of great resources on urban farming and small scale farming out there. Um, I have followed um, a number of farmers over the years. Um, Elliot Coleman, um, who is a four season farmer up in Maine, which inspired me to do four season farming. I figured like, hey, if you're up in Maine you can grow vegetables in the winter, there's no reason why we can't do it here in New Jersey. Um, and uh, Curtis Stone, um, who's up in Canada, is a really smart man, um, has a lot of good marketing um, ideas as well as, you know, using a small space and turning it in there, uh, turning it into a productive area. But um, my experience really just came from just um, being out there and observing what I'm doing, um, taking notes and, and, uh, and learning from my experiences. So uh, I think that's the best way to really get yourself out there is volunteer for organizations that are doing this, that are doing this farming work, talk to those, um, those leaders and then see piece together information that works for you and then applying it into your system. Okay, um, one last question, and this is for each of you. In, in your opinions, do you think a city could have enough gardens to feed itself and to be truly food independent? What do you see, uh, and, and what do you see as, as being the future of urban farming? I guess, Tobias, why don't you take a crack first? At this? Well, to me, because, you know, um, so what our farm to table co-op, CSA we have. Um, I rely on the support of uh, people I call community partners, collaborators. You know? So Dogwood Farms, an organic farm uh, run by John Knox and his family, um, can grow way more food than I can even imagine growing uh, in the small space that I utilize, right? And so, uh, and then there's uh, Deacon uh, Willie Davis in uh, Patterson, who uh, also grows a tremendous amount of food, uh, uh, so, you, I mean, this guy comes from an agricultural history um, way back when, you know, um, going back from Raleigh, North Carolina. And so, uh, and so that's how I see uh, the future of urban agriculture, where you have rural and urban um, and suburban communities finally coming together under this unifier we call and love food and realizing that it's going to take a collective uh, and body of work um, which is local still, um, to kind of work with each other and create a more a sustainable, community-driven, localized food system. That's how I see the future of agriculture. Great. Sean? I completely agree with that. And I would just say, I think it, as, as we develop our communities, we need to have this idea of farming in mind, not only, not relying on the food to get truck in, to our supermarkets, but working with local collaborators to develop these urban farms. And like what Tobias saying, work with those rural farms so that we're creating a sustainable and a, a secure food system for a community. I don't see any reason why we can't eat ourselves with the technology and the skills that we've developed over the years. Um, and and have less, less reliance on all of our produce coming from California. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. This has been very informative and very helpful. And uh, I hope perhaps there's a, a bridge that was built between Morristown and Newark. Uh, yes, here. yes, definitely. <laughs> we'll have to collaborate. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, this webinar uh, was recorded and will be posted on New Jersey Highlands Coalition's YouTube channel in, in the next couple of days. Our next webinar is on March 26th. It's titled Restoring Native and uh, Edible and Medicinal Plants uh, with Professional Ethnobotanist Jared Rosenbaum. Um, info for that is in the chat. And finally, if you like what you heard this evening and want to hear more, consider supporting the coalition. New Jersey Highlands Coalition 
by becoming by becoming an, a member. You can find out all about us on our website or by following us on social media. Thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you our presenters and have a good night everybody and stay safe. Thank you.